welcome to Gauntfish on Games, where today we're finally going to look at a machine that so far has really only cameoed in other videos. That's right, the Acorn Risk PC 600. Launched in 1994, this featured Acorn's most advanced CPU to date, the ARM 610. Yes, the ARM CPU that you find in your mobile and handheld devices today started off life as a processor for computers like this. This was a badly needed machine as the UK computer market had continued to change. Schools had started to look elsewhere for their computers, and Acorn's previous platform, the Archimedes, had never really sold all that well to the home markets. On top of that, even the Amiga and Atari were struggling with the rising PC platform, and gamers had started to look to the consoles for their gaming fix. So Acorn needed something big to counter this, and fast. And the result was the 600. Unfortunately, this meant they had to rush the machine which resulted in a few issues that we'll discover along the way. To do this incredible machine justice, I had to split this into multiple parts. We'll start with hardware, move to software, and end with upgrades. Now, if this interests you, then why don't you consider subscribing, as that will allow you to know when the videos go live. Hint, hint. So, let's just dive right in, shall we? The 600 came in this desktop-style case, which they had started to do with their BBC Master and Archimedes line. The front of the case has this flip open front that gives you access to the drive base, where we'll find the floppy disk drive, but there's also space for a compatible CD-ROM drive or 5.25 inch drive if you happen to have one, but I have neither. There are LEDs for power and drive access as well as holes at either end of the case for built-in speakers. And finally we have the power switch. This is possibly the easiest machine you'll ever find to work on, you just twist these two tabs pull them out and the top just pops off. You really can do a lot of upgrades and work on this machine without needing a screwdriver. The case is built out of these slices, of which there's space for a drive and expansion cards, and these two can be easily removed. Unplug the drive, take out these two holding pegs and it just slides off. This allows us to take a look at the motherboard and check out its various specs. The floppy drive we removed is a standard double-sided high-density drive, so it can read floppy disks from PC. The hard drive, which you can find here, is a 200 megabyte model, and to be honest, it's a bit loud. This card here is connected to the first CPU slot, and if we take it out, we can see it's an ARM 610 CPU running at 30 megahertz. Now just below it is the second CPU slot. Yes, this machine not only supports multiple CPUs, but it can also support multiple CPU architectures. You can easily fit an x86 CPU like a 486 or a Pentium into this slot. The hope being that if you could run software from multiple platforms on the machine, it might seem better value for money. Which was an idea they continued on from the original BBC Micro days. The next connector over here is used for the communication cards, like Acorn's EchoNet or more standard Ethernet cards. It even has its own opening at the back of the case to allow external connectors. We jump over to the other side of the board where we can find the expansion connector, which has a backplane card that would allow for two expansion cards to be installed. These podules, as they were known, allowed for adding all sorts of upgrades, like graphics, sound, or even IDE controllers. And due to the unique design of the case, you could easily add a second or third slice to the machine. And then you could buy a new backplane that added more connectors for more podules. It was a machine that was meant to grow with your needs. The rushed nature of the machine showed its head with the main system bus that was used to connect the CPU to the podules. It only allowed DMA access to the first two connectors, and even then it was known to be significantly slower than PCI connectors that PCs were using at the time. One area where this slow bus could be an issue was with RAM, which we can find here, where we have three slots. The first two are for system RAM, which are currently occupied by 8 megabyte sticks, and below that we can find a slot for VRAM, which you can use the machine if you don't have any fitted but it will end up using system RAM instead, and it would be more restricted in the screen modes it would support, and how quickly it could refresh. Currently, I have 1 megabyte fitted, and it seems that 2 megabytes was the highest that was typically sold. Video and sound are both provided by the VidC20 chip, 
which supports multiple screen modes, which include all the original modes from the BBC Micro. But on top of that, it also supported a whole set of high resolution and high color modes, and is really only limited by the amount of VRAM that you have. The video side is mostly a simple frame buffer and doesn't have any built in sprites or scrolling. This is backed by a high speed DMA channel, which makes drawing to the screen quite fast. But it is shared by the sound system, which consists of 8 audio channels, which technically support 8 and 16 bit audio. But due to the rush nature of the hardware, early units were missing some part of the hardware that enabled 16 bit audio. Though it can be restored through hardware mods and using either an upgraded software module or using the later firmware. But due to the shared DMA, most games tended to stick with the 8 bit audio as it freed up far more transfer time for graphics. We can actually see the connectors that you need to use to add the 16 bit audio back in here and here. Thankfully, the headers are here as on some of the early boards, these weren't even fitted. Another indication of the hurried nature of the team were the fact that this board has no connector for CD audio, which was rectified on later updates. It's also interesting to notice that there's actually space for two speakers on the front of the case. There doesn't seem to be any additional internal plugs for a second speaker, so I wonder if they had planned to do internal stereo or if they just hadn't decided where they'd put the speaker. One last thing to point out on the motherboard is the firmware, which can be found here. Now this is actually quite important, as about 3 quarters of the OS are actually located here, with the final quarter being loaded from the hard drive. And if you think this sounds a bit odd, it is, as Acorn preferred to have the entire OS running from ROM. But time constraints meant that part of the OS had to be loaded from the drive as it wasn't ready in time to be sent off to be burnt to chips. This can make rebuilding the machine a little bit more tricky, as I experienced when I got mine. This machine is running RISCOS 3.5, which the OS fits in a tiny 2 megabytes worth of ROM. But in later releases, like 3.7, that was double to 4 megabytes. And even then, it still had part of the OS on the drive. Now, I've done very little work on this machine so far. I've replaced the battery as the stock one had gone bad and was close into leaking onto the board and I wanted to get it out as quickly as possible before it damaged anything. The other bit of work was to replace the fan in the PSU, which was starting to sound a little grindy. With the motherboard fully explored, let's take a look at the connectors along the back. Power is provided via a standard kettle lead, but next to that is a 3.5 inch jack used for headphones or speakers. If neither are connected, then the internal speaker will take over the audio duties. A VGA standard connector is used for video, which can be run at either 30kHz for the modern resolutions or 15 when it runs the older BBC modes. I would recommend using a multi-sync monitor with this machine as it tends to jump between the various video modes depending on what you're doing. Acorn decided to drop their own keyboard connector for the PC's increasingly popular PS2 standard, which means you can use any basic PC keyboard, but the mouse still uses their custom connector as the Acorn machines came with a 3 button mouse as standard, which wasn't really common anywhere else. The mouse I have here is actually missing the ball, so I opted to get a converter that would allow me to use a PS2 mouse instead. I tend to use my 1999 MS Optical Explorer mouse, pressing in the wheel acts as the middle mouse button. Next up is that opening that we saw earlier for the communications port. And finally we have the parallel and serial ports. Now you might have noticed there was no dedicated joystick ports. Some of the home models, like the Archimedes 3010, included them, but it wasn't common across the range. So there were some modules that allowed you to use the serial port to be used as a joystick port, but you were still limited with what games would actually support it. So let's put this all back together again. and boot it up so we can have a quick look at the operating system. Which boots very quickly due to being on those ROM chips. At first glance, RISCOS 3.5 doesn't look all that different from most modern operating systems. 
we have a taskbar at the bottom with drives on the left and the tray of running applications on the right. And above that is the desktop where all our windows will go. Now how it uses the middle mouse button might trip you up, as for the most part the OS will do the main actions on both the left or right mouse button, with the middle click being used to bring up menus. For example, middle clicking on the drive allows us to check its size and free space, and it's a whopping 200 megabyte drive with about 50 megabytes free. And right clicking or left clicking will give us the contents. Following the standard they set out on the BBC Micro, applications tend to start with a bang or an exclamation mark. File extensions are more or less ignored by the OS. It has its own type system, which you can change by looking at the file details, which are then saved to metadata. Because of this, it's easy for file types to be lost when you transfer them between different formatted disks or computer systems. Thankfully, it's pretty quick to set it back. As it uses the drive as well as ROM, it makes it quite easy to add new system modules or change the boot sequence just by adding or editing the boot. And if you make any mistakes, you can just rename it and reboot the machine, and you'll basically end up back at your factory defaults. Though you will have to replace it or fix it, as it contains important parts of the OS, and those will be missing. If you do end up with a machine that doesn't have the boot sequence, don't worry, as you can find copies of it online. Now there are a few hoops that you're going to have to jump through to get an unzipper installed, and then extract the files. But once you've done that, the machine is pretty much ready to use. Now this wouldn't be the successor to the successor of the BBC Micro if it didn't have BBC Basic. And thankfully, hit F12, and then type in Basic, and there we have it, the Basic Prompt. So let's type out a very quick program. You know what we're going to do here. 10, print, Riscos is the best. 20, go to 10, if I can spell it, run. And wow, it runs very, very quickly. And all you have to do is type quit, hit return a second time. And there we go, back at the desktop. Now let's do something interesting and actually write a basic script. So we can start up the text editor and then write a new program. And it's going to be pretty much the same. 10, print, goldfish on the RISC PC 600, 20, go to 10, and then make sure you add an empty line at the end or it will complain. And with that done, let's save it. Now this is done slightly differently to how you might expect. Middle click, select save, give it a name, but then you drag the icon to where you want it to go, like so. Now we've closed the text editor and try running the program, it just brings up the editor again. So let's change its file type to basic, like so. And now if we run it, hey, it runs our script. Now I used line numbers and all that type of jazz, but it didn't need it anymore. They actually improved on BBC Basic to make it a proper scripting language. It was even used inside applications as part of its boot script. Now I think we're starting to stray into what we'll cover in the next part. So if you're interested in the software and more importantly its games, please join me in part two. And until then, I've been the Goldfish, that's one well-designed machine, and this was Goldfish on Games. Thank you very much for watching my video. If you enjoyed it, you know what to do. Bell, like, subscribe, share, all that fun gubbins. Or you can check out other videos that I've done through the links on the screen. And until next time, thanks and goodbye.